Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2022. Welcome to lesson number nine in the series on Genesis, titled Jacob the Supplanter. It's ready for teaching on May 28, and my name's Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, May 21. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we open your word and we come humbly before you, because you have shown in your word, not only are you the God who created the universe, but also the God who provides our salvation. And as we study more of the history of what happened in the early parts of this earth's history, as we look at the story of Jacob and those around him, we pray that we may not only just see your hand in his life and in the lives of those around him, but that we may know that your Holy Spirit is here with us, that you are with us to bless us and guide us in our daily livings. And Lord, today I'd like to pray for those who are listening in Tehran in Iran or those in Kathmandu in Nepal or Bangkok in Thailand or Caracas or Caracas in Venezuela or Blantyre in Malawi or Hamilton, New Zealand or Monterey in Mexico or San Juan in Puerto Rico or Manchester in the United Kingdom or Washington, D.C. Wherever people are listening, dear Lord, right now, I pray that you will bless them and that your word will become an open book for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 27 and verse 36. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and look now, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Let's read that again, Genesis 27, verse 36. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me these two times? He took away my birthright, and look now, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? We now pick up on the continued family history of Isaac, the miracle child and early ancestor of the promised seed. The story doesn't start out particularly well, however. The flawed character of his son Jacob will be manifested in the rivalry between the two brothers over the birthright. We'll read about that in Genesis 25, 27 to 37 tomorrow, and consequently over the right to obtain the blessings of Isaac, which we'll read about the following day. Because Jacob deceives his father and steals the blessing from his older brother, he will have to flee for his life. In exile, God confronts him at Bethel in Genesis chapter 28. From then on, Jacob the deceiver will experience some deception himself. Instead of Rachel, whom Jacob loves in Genesis 29, Leah, the older daughter, will be given to Jacob and he will have to work 14 years to earn his wives. Yet Jacob also will experience God's blessing, for in exile he will have 11 of his sons and God will increase his wealth. Thus, whatever else we can see in this story, we can see how God will fulfill his covenant promises one way or another, regardless of how often his people fail. Sunday, May 22, Jacob and Esau. Read Genesis chapter 25, verses 21 to 34. Compare the two personalities of Jacob and Esau. What qualities of Jacob predisposed him to be worthy of Isaac's blessing? Genesis 25, beginning at verse 21. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted her plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. 
So, when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. Afterward his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was sixty years old when she bore them. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skilful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I am about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Already from their mother's womb we understand that Jacob and Esau are different and will struggle against each other. While Esau is described as a tough hunter running in the field, Jacob is seen as a mild person sitting in the tent and meditating. The Hebrew word tam, T-A-M, translated mild, is the same verb applied to Job and to Noah, translated blameless for Job. In Job 1 verse 8, then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and also perfect for Noah, as we read in Genesis 6 verse 9, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. This difference of character becomes more manifest later in their lives. And uh, we read that story in Genesis 27 verse 1 through to chapter 28 and verse 5. Now it came to pass, when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, that he called Esau his oldest son and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. Then he said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me and make me savoury food such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savoury food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savoury food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it into your father that he may eat it, and then he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah his mother, Look, Esau my brother is a hairy man, and I am a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go. Get them for me. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savoury food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the savoury food and bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went in to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? 
Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac his father, and he felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him, because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. Then he said, Are you ready, my son Esau? He said, I am. He said, Bring it near me, and I will eat of my son's game, so that my soul may bless you. So he brought it near to him, and he ate. And he brought him wine, and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near now, and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his clothing, and blessed him, and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field, which the Lord has blessed. Therefore may God give you of the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth, and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you, and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren, and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be those who bless you. Now it happened, as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. He also had made savoury food, and brought it to his father, and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceeding great and bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me, me also, O my father. But he said, Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me these two times? He took away my birthright, and now, look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master, and all his brethren I have given to him. As servants... With grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth, and of the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass, when you become reckless, that you shall break his yoke from your neck. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she went and called Jacob her younger son and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth, if Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like those who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? 
Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you, and may you fruitful and multiply you that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away and he went to Paddan Aram to Laban the son of Bethuel the Syrian the brother of Rebekah the mother of Jacob and Esau. Esau comes home tired and hungry and finds Jacob cooking lentils. For Esau, the immediate visible and physical enjoyment of food, this day, as recorded in Genesis 25.31, is more important than the future blessing associated with his birthright. And we're going to compare this with Hebrews chapter 12, verses 16 and 17. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Ellen White writes in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 177, The promises made to Abraham and confirmed to his son were held by Isaac and Rebekah as the great objects of their desires and hopes. With these promises, Esau and Jacob were familiar. They were taught to regard the birthright as a matter of great importance, for it included not only an inheritance of worldly wealth, but spiritual preeminence. He who received it was to be the priest of his family, and in the line of his posterity, the Redeemer of the world would come. End of quote. For Jacob, in contrast to his brother, the future spiritual significance of blessing is what matters. Yet later, under the instigation of his mother, as we read in Genesis 27, Jacob openly and purposely deceives his father even using the name of the Lord your God in verse 20 of chapter 27, in perpetrating that deception. He commits this terrible deception, even though it was for something that he knew was good. The results were tragic, adding whole new layers of dysfunction to an already dysfunctional family. And so to finish today, Jacob wanted something good, something of value, and that was admirable, especially compared to his brother's attitude. Yet he used deception and lies to get it. How can we avoid falling into a similar trap of doing bad so that good may come? Monday, May 23, Jacob's Ladder As soon as Esau learns that Jacob has received his father's blessing, he understands that he has been deceived and supplanted by his brother. We read that yesterday in Genesis twenty-seven thirty-six, and he wants to kill him in verse 42. Rebekah is worried and wants to prevent this crime that would be fatal for both sons in verse 45. So, with the support of Isaac, in chapter 28, verse 5, she urges Jacob to flee to her family, in verse 43 of chapter 27. On his way to exile, Jacob encounters God in a dream at a place that he will call Bethel, the house of God, and there will make a vow. Compare Genesis 28, 10 to 22 with Genesis 11, 1 to 9. How is Bethel different from Babel? What lesson can we learn about our relationship with God from Jacob's experience at Bethel versus what happened at Babel? First of all, Genesis 28, beginning at verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. 
Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of the Lord were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven." Then Jacob arose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he named the name of that place Bethel. But the name of the city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, Then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me I will surely give a tenth to you. And Genesis chapter 11 verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, Let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. In this dream, Jacob sees an extraordinary ladder that is connected with God. The same Hebrew verb natsav, N-A-T-S-A-V, is used to refer to the ladder that is set up in Genesis 28 verse 12, and the Lord who stood in the following verse, verse 13, as if the ladder and the Lord are the same thing. The ladder is linked to the attempt at Babel to reach heaven. Like the Tower of Babel, the ladder is to reach the door of heaven. But while the Tower of Babel represents the human effort to go up and reach God, The ladder of Bethel emphasizes that access to God can be achieved only through God's coming to us and not through human effort. As for the stone on which Jacob had put his head and had his dream, it becomes the symbol of Bethel, the house of God, in verse 17. We'll compare that with chapter 28 and verse 22. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Which points to the temple, the sanctuary, the centre of God's saving activity for humanity. Yet, Jacob does not limit to the spiritual and the mystical his expression of worship and sense of awe concerning what had happened to him. That is, he wanted to respond in concrete outward terms. Thus, Jacob decides to give a tenth to God, not in order to obtain God's blessing, but as a grateful response to God's gift, which already has been given to him. Here again we see the idea of tithe long before the rise of the nation of Israel. And so to finish today, 
Read Genesis 28, verse 22. The tithe is taken from all that you give me. Let's read that. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that you give me I will surely give a tenth to you. What important point should we take from what Jacob says here about tithe and what it is? Tuesday, May 24. The Deceiver Deceived. Read Genesis chapter 29, verses 1 to 30. How and why does God allow for Laban's deception? What lessons did Jacob learn? Genesis 29, beginning at verse 1. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field, and behold, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it, for out of that well they watered the flocks. A large stone was on the well's mouth. Now all the flocks would be gathered there, and they would roll the stone from the well's mouth, water the sheep, and put the stone back in its place on the well's mouth. And Jacob said to them, My brethren, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. Then he said to them, Do you know Laban the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. So he said to them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And look, his daughter Rachel is coming with the sheep. Then he said, Look, it is still high day. It is not time for the cattle to be gathered together. Water the sheep and go and feed them. But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered together, and they have rolled the stone from the well's mouth. Then we water the sheep. Now, while he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came to pass, when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth, and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel, and lifted up his voice, and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative, and that he was Rebekah's son. So she ran and told her father. Then it came to pass, when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him, and embraced him, and kissed him, and brought him to his house. So he told Laban all these things, and Laban said to him, Surely you are my bone and my flesh. And he stayed with him for a month. Then Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my relative, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what should your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters, the name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were delicate, but Rachel was beautiful of form and appearance. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah his daughter and brought her to Jacob, and he went in to her. And Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, It must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for service, which you will serve with me still seven years. Then Jacob did so and fulfilled her week. So he gave him his daughter Rachel as wife also, and Laban gave his son Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as a maid. Then Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban still another seven 
years. The first thing that Jacob sees when he arrives at the place of destination is a stone, perhaps a hint referring back to the stone of Bethel, which signified God's presence, as we read in chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it, and he called the name of the place Bethel. But the name of that city has been Luz previously. It is this stone that will, after all, give Jacob the opportunity to interact with Rachel. When Jacob hears from the standing shepherds that Rachel is coming with her sheep to water her flock, he urges the shepherds to roll away the stone. They refuse, which gives Jacob the opportunity to do it alone, and to introduce himself to Rachel, which he did in verse 11. Rachel responds by running to her family. This first contact between Jacob and Rachel was productive. Jacob loved Rachel, it said in verse 18, so much that the seven years he worked for Laban in exchange for Rachel were like a few days, we read in verse 20. However, after these seven years, Jacob is deceived. On the night of the wedding, it is Leah, the elder sister, and not Rachel, whom Jacob discovers in his bed. Taking advantage of the confusion of the feast and of Jacob's intense emotion and vulnerability, Laban had managed this trick. Interestingly, Jacob uses the same root word for deceive in Genesis 29-25 that Isaac had used to characterise Jacob's behaviour toward his father and his brother in chapter 27, verse 35. But he said, Your brother came with deceit, and has taken away your blessing. Note that the same thinking also is implied in the Lex Talionis, Law of Retaliation, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, of Exodus 21, verse 24. And we'll compare this with Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. This forces the culprit to identify with his or her victim in that the culprit faces what the victim did. In a similar way, then, what Jacob had done to someone else had now been done to him. Jacob understands now what it means to be the victim of deception. Ironically, God teaches Jacob about his own deception through Laban's deception. Although Jacob, as deceiver in Genesis 27.12, knows well what deception means, he is surprised when he is the victim of deception. Genesis 27.12 Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself, and not a blessing. Thus he asks the question, Why? Have you deceived me? In Genesis 29, verse 15, which shows that he knows deception is wrong. So to finish the day, though Jacob was the deceiver, he himself was the deceived. How can we learn to trust God when we don't see justice being done, when we see people who do evil get away with it, or when we see the innocent suffer? Wednesday, May 25. The Blessing of the Family. For Jacob, the last seven years of exile are a burden, and yet these also are the most fruitful years. In them, Jacob will father eleven of the twelve children who will become the ancestors of God's people. This section constitutes the centre of Jacob's story, which we read about in Genesis 25.19 to chapter 35, verse 26, and it begins and ends with the key phrase, God opened the womb, referring to Leah in Genesis 29.31 and to Rachel in Genesis 30, verse 22. Each time this statement is followed by births, The evidence is that these births are the result of God's miraculous action. Read Genesis 29, 31 to chapter 30, verse 22. 
How are we today to understand the meaning of what takes place here? Beginning at Genesis 29 and verse 31. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Behold, the Lord has heard that I am unloved. He has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel, and he said, Am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So she said, Here is my maid Bilhah, go into her, and she will bear a child on my knees, that I also may have children by her. Then she gave him Bilhah, her maid, as wife, and Jacob went into her, and Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore she called his name Dan. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, With great wrestlings I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. So she called his name Naphtali. When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpah her maid and gave her to Jacob as wife. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, A troop comes. So she called his name Gad. And Leah's maid Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, I am happy for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher. Now Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, Is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, Therefore he will lie with you tonight for your son's mandrakes. When Jacob came out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. And he lay with her that night. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. Then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me, because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterwards she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. God opened Leah's womb, and she had a son, Reuben, whose name contains the verb ra, that's R-A apostrophe A-H, which means to see. Because God saw that she was unloved by Jacob in Genesis twenty nine thirty one, this child was compensation for her in her pain and suffering. In addition, she gives the name of Simeon, which contains the verb Shama, S-H-A-M-A, -A, or heard, to her second son, because God had heard Shama, the depth and the humiliation of her pain, and thus had pity on her, just as he had heard Hagar's affliction. We read that in Genesis 29 verse 33. Leah's son Simeon also will resonate with the name of Hagar's son Ishmael, which means God will hear. Let's look at Genesis chapter 16 and verse 11. 
And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. When Leah gives birth to her last son, she calls him Judah, which means praise. Leah does not refer to her pain or even her blessing any more. She just focuses on God and praises him for his grace. Strangely, it is only when Leah cannot give birth again that God remembers Rachel and opens Rachel's womb, as we read in chapter 30 and verse 22. Rachel, the beloved wife, had to wait seven years after her marriage and fourteen years after her betrothal with Jacob to have her first son, as we read in chapter 29, verse 18. 18. Now Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. And verse 27. Fulfill her week, and we will give you this one also for the service which you will serve with me still another seven years. And we'll compare that with Genesis chapter 30, verse 25. And it came to pass, when Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go to my own place and to my country. She gave him the name of Joseph to signify that God had taken away. The word is A-S-A-F, Asaph, my reproach. And shall add Yasef, Y-A-S-A-F, to me another son, as we read in Genesis chapter 30, verses 23 and 24. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. However wrong some of these situations were, God was still able to use them, even if he didn't condone them, in order to create a nation from the seed of Abraham. So to finish today, in what ways does this story reveal that God's purposes will be fulfilled in heaven and on earth, despite human foibles and errors? Thursday, May 26, Jacob Leaves In this story, Jacob, who deceived his father and his brother to acquire the family birthright, and who stole the blessing that Isaac designed to give to his elder son, nevertheless remained passive toward Laban and served him faithfully. Jacob knows well that he has been deceived by his father-in-law, and yet he let it go. It is difficult to understand Jacob's passivity considering his temperament. Jacob could have revolted or at least resisted Laban or bargained with him, but he didn't. He just did what Laban asked, no matter how unfair it all was. Nevertheless, at the birth of Rachel's first son, Joseph, Jacob finally reached the fourteenth year of his service to Laban, as we read in Genesis chapter 30 and verse 26. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you and let me go, for you know my service which I have done for you. And now considers leaving Laban in order to return to the promised land, but Jacob is concerned about providing for his own house, as he says in verse 30, for what you had before I came was little, and it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming, and now when shall I also provide for my own house? Read Genesis chapter 30, verses 25 to 32. What is happening here, and what kind of reasoning does Jacob use? What is Laban's response? Genesis 30, beginning at verse 25, And it came to pass, when Rachel had born Joseph, that Jacob said to Laban, Send me away, that I may go to my own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children, for whom I have served you, and let me go. For you know my service, which I have done for you. 
And Laban said to him, Please stay, if I have found favour in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Then he said, Name me your wages, and I will give it. So Jacob said to him, You know how, how I have served you, and how your livestock has been with me? For what you had before I came was little, and it has increased to a great amount. The Lord has blessed you since my coming, and now when shall I also provide for my own house? So he said, What shall I give you? And Jacob said, you shall not give me anything. If you will do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep your flocks. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep, and all the brown ones among the lambs, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. It had been a very long detour for Jacob, who had long been gone from home. It probably had not been his original intention to stay away from his country for so long, but events kept him away for years. It's now time to return home, and what a family he will return with, too. Meanwhile, Jacob's unnatural compliance suggests that Jacob has perhaps changed. He has understood the lesson of faith. That is, Jacob waits for God's signal to go. It is only when God speaks to him that Jacob decides to move. God reveals himself to Jacob as the God of Bethel and commands Jacob to leave Laban's house and return to your family, as it says in verse 13 of chapter 31. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. With the same words that God used to call Abram to leave from from your family in Genesis chapter 12 verse 1. What helped him see that it was time to go too was the attitude of Laban's sons and Laban himself, as we read in Genesis 31 verses 1 and 2. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's sons saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's and from what was our father's he has acquired all this wealth. And Jacob saw the countenance of Laban, and indeed it was not favourable toward him as before. In Patriarchs and Prophets, page 193, we read, Jacob would have left his crafty kinsman long before, but for the fear of encountering Esau. Now he felt that he was in danger from the sons of Laban, who, looking after his wealth as their own, might endeavour to secure it by violence. End of quote. Hence he took his family and possessions and left, thus beginning another phase in the great saga of God's covenant people. Friday, May 27. God chose Jacob not because he deserved it, but because of his grace. And yet, Jacob worked hard to try to deserve grace, which itself is a contradiction. If he deserved it, then it wouldn't be grace, it would be works, which is contrary to the gospel. Let's read Romans chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Only later did Jacob start to understand the significance of God's grace and what it meant to trust God, to live by faith, and to be completely dependent on the Lord. Jacob's experience contains an important lesson for the ambitious person. Do not strive to promote yourself at the expense of others. 
There's a quote from the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, page 1095. It's written by Ellen G. White. Jacob thought to gain a right to the birthright through deception, but he found himself disappointed. He thought he had lost everything, his connection with God, his home and all, and there he was, a disappointed fugitive. But what did he do? He looked upon him in his hopeless condition. He saw his disappointment, and he saw there was material there that would render back glory to God. No sooner does he see his condition than he presents the mystic ladder, which represents Jesus Christ. Here is man who had lost all connection with God, and the God of heaven looks upon him and consents that Christ shall bridge the gulf which sin has made. We might have looked and said, I long for heaven, but how can I reach it? I see no way. That is what Jacob thought. And so God shows him the vision of the ladder, and that ladder connects earth with heaven, with Jesus Christ. A man can climb it, for the base rests upon the earth, and the topmost round reaches into heaven. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. 1. Look at the characters of these people, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, Esau, Laban, Rachel and Leah, in some of these accounts of sacred history. Look at all the lies and deception involved. What does this teach us about human nature in general and God's grace? And 2. As you read the story of Jacob, what evidence can you find that over time his character was maturing and growing? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled My Most Valuable Possession and once again it's written by Theda Pina. As is my custom, I opened my Bible to read on a flight from Namibia to South Africa. Immediately a young man beside me spoke up. Is that a Bible? he asked. He apparently was from Eastern Europe. Yes, it's a Bible, I said. Do you believe in the Bible? he inquired. Yes, with all my heart. He said his grandparents used to read the Bible to him, but that he didn't believe the stories, especially creation. I shared my life-changing experience as a person who had returned to God after 15 years on my own and was led by him to a place of safety in the world. He was interested in my story. Can I hold your Bible, please? he asked. It was thrilling to see my Bible in his hands. It seemed to make a big impression on him. After he handed it back, I read out loud from Isaiah 43. He listened with interest to God's promises of protection. Before the plane landed, I asked, Would you accept a gift? In my bag, I had a copy of Steps to Christ. He didn't want to take the book, but I assured him that I had another copy. If you have any questions, please text me, I said, writing my phone number inside the cover. To my surprise, within a day of my arrival home in Ireland, he texted, I'm home safely. I prayed, I don't think this is a coincidence. He wrote that he had met a woman in Namibia who prayed daily. Seeing that, I started thinking about my grandparents reading the Bible, and then I met you, he said. I don't believe in coincidences, I said. Let God speak to your heart. We texted every so often, and I sent Bible verses. One day he sent me a picture of a church. I live next to this church, he said. I replied that I wanted to mail him a history of the Christian church, and when I received his address, I sent him the great controversy. Sometime later, someone sent me a video about the plan of salvation, and I passed it on to him. He responded, This is so amazing. I prayed, Lord, I need to know what might work in his life. A strong thought came to mind. He held your Bible. Give him your Bible. 
I have decided to mail my Bible to him. I have written a letter saying, This is my most precious possession. God gave his only son the most precious thing that he had for our salvation. I hope you will read this, My Most Precious Possession. This mission story illustrates spiritual growth objective number five of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to disciple individuals and families into spirit-filled lives. You can read more about this on IWillGo2020.org. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful.